When I left the Army as a enlisted man, I was a private first class. I was a company aide man in an infantry company, which means I was a medic. And I was assigned to F Company, 116th Infantry Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division, which was the Maryland Virginia National Guard, and we were known as the Blue and Gray Division. And our regiment, the 116th, was, uh, all, was called the Stonewall Brigade because it, it's still in existence today as part of the National Guard of Virginia, and it goes all the way back to when Stonewall Jackson took the troops out of Lexington, Virginia, and went into the Civil War with them. And that we are still in existence today. Excellent. Proud heritage, right? Very proud. We're very proud. When we play Dixie, we stand up. All right. Excellent. If you guys can't hear or anything like that, if you wanted to move around to this side, feel free. You're not gonna, you're not gonna bother us at all. All right. So, Paul, tell me, how old were you when you uh, first entered the army? I went into the army uh, at just at 18. I was 18 years old. I went into the army and uh, I was assigned to the 29th Division. Uh, that was my initial. I had basic training in the United States. I was trained as a medic, combat medic, and uh, I joined the 29th Division in uh, 42 in England. Uh, we were had gone over there to England, the 29th Division that is, had gone over to England when the 1st Division pulled out to go to North Africa to fight. We came in and, and took their places in Britain. Okay. And that's where we trained for the invasion of, well, for an invasion, a period. We had no idea where that landing was bit to be. But uh, when we first started to train for the invasion, we were training uh, on British boats because we still had not gotten the LCVPs over to, uh, to England to train there. And then finally the Navy came in and we started to train with uh, those, that type of a vessel. Okay. So you guys knew that something was going to happen, you just didn't know what it was? We had, we, we knew that we were going to be involved pretty deeply. And apparently the, with the, all the aquatics that we were training uh, in, uh, we figured it was going to be a first wave type of operation. But here again, it was all conjecture with us. Uh, we weren't told too much at all, you know, up until the last, until just before the invasion. Now, what was the uh, chatter amongst the uh, amongst the men in your uh, division? Were you excited? Were you nervous? Were you proud to be the first wave? What were your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, we were two weeks before the invasion. We were training in England. We were down in the training. Basically, the division was uh, in Devon and Cornwall, which is down in the, uh, the south uh, east corner of uh, England. And uh, one evening we were having chow uh, and we were all dressed up to go out in our uniform for the evening. And a door opened up. I can still see the first sergeant walked in that door and he hollered, I want everybody's attention. And we all looked up and we said, what's he want? He says, all leaves are canceled. You're to go back to your squad rooms and turn in your class A uniforms. That's when we knew something was hot. And we were restricted from then on and for the next couple of days, we were about the next week and then we went to a marshalling area and we were really sort of locked in at that area. We couldn't talk to anybody except our own people. And that's when they started to give us the idea where of what we were, where we were going to land as far as pictures go, but we did not know the name of the towns or anything like that. No. So walk us up to the uh, the days leading up to the invasion. What were some of the things that were happening? What were some of the sights, the sounds? The well, <clears throat> we were issued ammunition. You took as much ammunition as you wanted. I was a medic. I did not have a weapon. The only thing I had was the white Red Cross on my arm, and I was dressed like the rest of the soldiers, my helmet, 
was uh, just regular uh, helmet like everybody else wore, no red crosses on it. Uh, we were given briefings uh, and also we were given small pieces of money which we found out were French money and that's when we knew we were going to France anyhow. And uh, <clears throat> as I say, we were really restricted in an area. We had the military police were outside of that area. And uh, the only thing we could do was really just go to Chow, go to these meetings, which was held in a large tent, and back to our squad tents where we were sleeping. And then two days before the invasion, we were told load up and we got all of our gear together and we were taken to the ship. We were taken to a ship called, my group went to a ship called the uh, Thomas Jefferson, which was a Navy ship. And uh, we had some more briefings aboard that ship. As to where we were going, we saw pictures of what the beach basically looked like at that point. And I, I can remember at that point looking at a house because we had a picture of, of a plane took it coming in toward the beach there. And I remember seeing this house. And later, when we got on the beach later, I remember looking up and I said, there's that house I saw. And uh, on, we were supposed to go on June the 5th that the weather was so bad and Eisenhower at that point was still trying to make a decision whether to go because the weather reports were so bad. And of course we knew nothing about those things. All we knew we were on a ship and it was messy, you know, weather-wise. Uh, <clears throat> the night of the 5th, uh, we all went to, back to the bunks that we had and we were told you're going to be awakened during the night and sure enough about midnight they came back in and they said okay guys get down to the Navy mess hall and have breakfast and we went down and we got in there and we had a very the Navy gave us a, a wonderful breakfast and uh, we were told go back to your quarters and start to get your uniforms get your equipment which we did and we were told, this is it, we're going tonight. We're going this evening. And we were called up on deck about 3 a.m. We went up on deck, it was pitched, it was dark, it was lousy, we got all this gear on us that we had basically trained with. And uh, about 3.30, we were to, told to go over the side into these uh, LCVPs. Now, the Navy had davits and uh, they would the uh, they would load up the the boat the LCVP up right off the deck. You get it, and then they would when it was full, they'd just drop it down to the water. And I remember that my group, when we got into we got into this thing, and it, the davits wouldn't work and the boat wouldn't get down. So they said get out. So we got out, and they took that that LCVP and somehow they got it down to the water and then they threw cargo nets over and we had to go down cargo nets. We had trained with cargo nets and we were pretty familiar with them. But when you're trying to go down one at night and, and that thing's moving back and forth because the sea was quite rough out there. Uh, it's quite a job with all this gear that you have on you try to go down that cargo net. A little scary, but we got down we, the whole group got down into it, of my group and uh, my platoon men, people, and uh, we bounced around out there. They, we pulled away from the mothership, as we called it, and we went around in circles for quite some time before the order came to head for the beach. And I understand, and I've been trying to get this straight for years, how many miles we were from the ship to the beach. And uh, one report I have is seven miles. And when we started in, the water was rough. These things are flat bottom. Flat bottoms don't operate too well on a, a, a rough sea. You're bouncing. And what happened, the, also the water started to come in the front of this thing. These LCVPs means Landy Craft Vehicle Personnel. You can either put a Jeep in there or put men in there. 
And the way they operate to get in and out of it, they have a ramp that goes down in the front. Uh, but when we got in there, water was coming in that ramp in due time, and I had water about a uh, third of the way, maybe a halfway up my, my leg from my ankle, between my ankle and my knee. And all of us were that way. And we were bouncing quite a bit, and the fellows started to get sick, and some of the fellows were throwing up. And that's a real mess when you're standing water and guys are throwing up in that water. They couldn't even get up to throw over the side. I mean, to get up the side and throw over. Uh, so as we started to move in toward the beach, the big ships out in the, and I believe it was the Texas was the battleship that was out behind us. They began to, to blast the beaches area there and inland also because the Germans have had this whole area that we landed in, uh, they had been working on it for a couple of years to, to, to support it with all type of weapons and everything. And we went on in toward the beach and I, we were, for some time, we were bouncing around out there. I was in the back of the LCVP being a, a medic. I was in the back of that area. And uh, I, I can remember the, uh, we were wet with spray and everything like that. It was getting pretty miserable. And finally, uh, with all this noise going on and everything, uh, an officer, we had an officer that was up in the front and he hollered, he hollered to us, he, hey, we're going in, we're going in. And sure enough, we went in and these sailors uh, that were running this thing, they were right in back of me. They steered it from the back. Uh, all of a sudden, that ramp went down and we started, we knew that as soon as that ramp goes down, you ran out as fast as you could. When we ran out, we actually ran into a slough type of a situation where we were on water up to above my waist and then all of a sudden it got deep. And we had Navy life preservers on, which we should have been wearing up high, and I did have mine up high. And that, that life preserver looked like a wide belt about four inches high, and it went around us, and it had a couple of tubes of CO2, I think it was called. And if you start, needed to use that, that light preserver, you would grab onto it and just squeeze it, and that would activate these CO2 tubes, which would put the gas in it, and it would blow up on you. And one of the problems was that we had so much weight on us, a lot of the fellows did not wear it high, and they had it down a little bit too low around their waist area, and when they squeezed it, because of the weight on their back, they went backwards and when I, were actually upside down. Their feet was up on the up, their heads, and they drowned. A lot of, quite a number of men drowned. I didn't see them drown, and I don't know how many of our fellows are actually of my uh, uh, company drowned in the water, but some did. I I was able to just paddle my way across that slough there and get back on, have my feet on the sand, and and <clears throat> we landed in a place called Dog Red Sector, and it was right at the bottom of a, a draw called Le Moyne Draw. And the Germans, on both sides of that draw, they had emplacements with machine guns, and they were really popping us. Not only that, but there was a hill that where we landed, there was a hill. It was not a cliff, it was a hill, uh, which you could walk up. and. In that situation, we got to this, to what they call the seawall. It wasn't that high. It was about maybe four feet high where we landed, and we could look up on that hill. And we were there for quite some time, those of us that had gotten that far, and there was a number of fellows that were out on the beach there. And being a medic, we, I was trying to get as many as them um, and patch up those guys that were hit. Our company commander was um, man, Captain Callahan, 
I was wounded and out on the beach about 20 feet from that seawall and myself and two other fellows went and grab, grabbed him by the arms and just pulled him. I mean, he didn't say, does this hurt? You just grabbed and pulled and we got him up that seawall. And another medic came along and worked on him and I, I, I just was going along checking the fellows that were against that seawall and then finally, the sergeant says, come on, we're going to go, we're going over this seawall. So we climbed up and went over that seawall, and there was a road there uh, that ran parallel with the beach, and we uh, went across that road and got into sort of a ditch there, and on the other side, uh, right above us, was this hill, of course. And uh, for some reason, we broke. When I say we broke, we got across that little road and, and we were in a ditch over there and all of a sudden, for some reason, everybody got up and ran and we ran back and jumped back on the beach again, which we realized then we were you know, scared. And uh, so the, the sergeant says, hey, we're going back over again. So we went back over again and we started up. The, uh, the riflemen started up that hill and I tailed along and a number of them were wounded. I stopped in with what I did the best I could for them at the time. But my orders were to stay with the platoon of the company, which I did. And we got up to the top of that hill. And uh, at that point, there was quite a number of dead Germans and things like that from all that artillery and everything. And. Uh, but I didn't get on top of that hill and the invasion time was 0630 and I don't think I got up to that top of that hill until well after 11 o'clock that morning. And I went with the uh, platoon and at this point we were at, uh, we had about half of the platoon. The rest of them had either been drowned, killed, whatever, on the beach. And I stayed with them, stayed with that platoon all that day. I stayed with them. Uh, I knew that when we got to the top of that hill, that our orders were to, to go to the right. We knew that from the briefing we had, and that's exactly what we did. Uh, Captain Callahan, I never saw him again in, for, for 50 years. And I was at a reunion in, in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and in the lobby one night and a voice said, hey, Paul, and I turned around and I looked and I thought, who is that? And he walked over to me and put his hand out and he says, I'm Bill Callahan. And I said, my Lord, I haven't seen you since 1944. So, and so we went in on that beach with 181 men, or 182, we never got that figure exact of the company, Company F. Uh, that night we counted noses and we could find 52 of us out of that company. Now they weren't all killed and wounded, they were just scattered too. It was utter confusion, believe me. Well, that, that was my D-Day. I, I stayed with the, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, platoon until I was uh, finally wounded in late July, just outside of St. Low, and I was hit in the arm. Fortunately, it was not a bad one. And uh, I had to go back to the rear at that point and uh, just outside of St. Low. And I stayed with the uh, medical division, medical unit back there. And I was back there a week, and then I went back to my unit again. That was it. When you when you first went through the, uh, or when you were first on the landing craft, you said that uh, the battleships behind you opened up. What, describe the sound. What did that, what did that sound like? What were you hearing? Well, we've often talked about it when we, you know, got together later and it, it sounded like a train was going to go over the top of your head. That's about this close. It, tremendous explosions. I mean, I think they had 16 inch guns on that thing. I mean, that's a big weapon. Uh, a battleship. I mean, that's a huge ship. And they also, not just the battleships were out there, but they also had 
cruisers out there, and uh, not being a Navy man, I don't know the terminology of a lot of these things, but uh, they had all kind of ships out there. Uh, on D plus one night, or afternoon, I should say, I went back to the beach with another medic because we were out of everything. I didn't have morphine or anything at all. And this, by the way, this case is the exact same type of a case that the combat medic wears. And had all our things in there, our bandages, morphine, uh, everything, there, the sulfur, things like that. And we had to go back to, we finally said, look, we don't have anything, we gotta get back and get some material. Uh, so we went back to the beach and I'll never forget, I went down, we went down Lemoyne Draw. And it's at the top of the draw, there were troops coming up, there was coming in, and the second infantry division fellows were coming in and they, they had probably seen some of the mess on the beach and they were ready to start a, they were ready to go to war. So we just stood aside and very, never moved because those guys had their rifles ready. <laughs> we didn't want to get popped <laughs> at that point. And we went down and went up at the top there. When I looked down and saw all those ships out at sea and all of them lined up along that beach and the mess on that beach is when I really realized what that invasion was about. It was a tremendous operation. It was a tremendous operation. And uh, I did get, we did get our supplies and we went back to our companies and stayed with them. When you were looking out over that beach, um, obviously I know that I've, from, from stuff that I've read that there was landing craft bogged down in the sand. There's, there was stuff that was just an absolute mess. It was a mess. It was a positive mess. I remember as we went along that beach, when we got down the bottom of Lemoyne Draw, that we, we did a, walked along that road that I was telling you about that we had gone across twice. And the Navy was bringing in materials and the place was, how they, they kept it from mass confusion, I don't know, but they did. And we walked along the beach where I saw a Navy officer and I said, walked over to him and I said, I said, we're looking for some Navy, or for some medical supplies. And he said, wait a minute. He looked at us and he figured the way we were at that point, dressed and everything, uh, that we had probably been in there first early waves. So he did take us down to the beach and, and we found a lot of medical supplies and this Navy fellow said, take what you want, fellas. And I remember loading my bag up with uh, uh, morphine surrettes and uh, some bandages and some sulfur and things like that that I needed. Uh, but if that's when I walked along that beach and I really realized, you know, what a mess thing this operation this was. It was very impressive. Now, I'm trying to think of a young man who was in my regiment, the 116th Infantry, and he was killed on the beach. And he came from Everett of Pennsylvania. I'm trying, I can't think of what his name was. I did not know him. He was in another company. But I met his brother after the war, and his brother said that this fellow had been killed and was in the 29th Division, 116th Infantry. And he lived in a house on Main Street in effort, which is basically across the street from Applebee's. And I can't think of what his name was, but he is buried up in the cemetery there at Cedar Hill Cemetery. I wish I could remember his name. I'm sorry, I just can't remember that, what his name was. I knew it for years, believe me. And I've gone up to that cemetery numerous times through the years just to, to pay my respects to, to this fellow. But as I said, I did not know him. His first name was Milton. I know that, I can't remember what his last name was. When you, uh, I know we're, we're jumping around in the story here a little bit, going back and forth. When you first hit that beach and that door dropped, what were the first, besides all the guys running off, what were the first sights or sounds that you saw? What were the first things that you saw? 
the first thing, I guess the first thing were the back of the heads of the fellows that were in front of me because I had to follow them. I mean, if they took a right, I had to go with them. So I had to keep my eye, where are they? And, and then we were ducking. I mean, you had to duck. For, you know, you, you got so scared. I, I know from my own personal experience, I was petrified almost, but I kept moving. I did see fellows who were petrified and, and, st and just plain stopped. One or two stopped. Uh, the object was to get to that wall as fast as possible. And, and Jerry was popping away with mortars. He was dropping mortars down in there. And uh, machine guns, you could hear the machine guns. And, and we still weren't ourselves as far as riflemen. Our riflemen were not even firing at that point. They had their weapons and they were running with them. We were trying to get to that seawall as fast as we could. Uh, we lost an awful lot of men trying to get to that seawall. Uh, the company that was to come in on our right, George Company, G Company, was to come in on our right, and somehow they got fouled up, and they actually came in to our back and over to our left. Uh, there was a gap then between where we came in and the Vereville entranceway where A Company came in. And when the A Company came in there, they lost 85% of their men in the first 15 minutes. They're known as the Bedford Boys because they came, their company, A Company came from Bedford, Virginia. And that town today has the big D-Day Memorial. And anyone that ever has the opportunity and are down in that area, I would certainly recommend that they go see that. That is extremely impressive uh, to see that. Uh, but uh, it, it gets mass confusion. Uh, my uh, my uh, uh, platoon leader was wounded also. Uh, and, uh, I never did see him after we hit that seawall. He was uh, wounded, and but he was survi he survived the war also. I understand. Uh, our company we had uh, five officers, and on D plus three, the last of those officers was wounded, and we had uh, the sergeants really were the fellows that got us really move and, and they did a wonderful job the officers did as long as they were with us did a great job and then we started to get of course uh, replacement officers uh, to take the place of those that were wounded and everything when uh, when some of your some of your other men in your in your uh, landing craft hit the beach and they realized how deep the water was. Were they shedding equipment and just dropping what they could just to get onto the beach, or? Uh, some of the fellows, uh, most of our equipment were hooked onto us. So, I mean, you didn't want to stop and unhook. I mean, you just did the best you can. But I do know that fellows did drop their weapons, their, we their, rep their rifles. They did do that, I know that. But, you know, there were guys laid, uh, that were wounded that were up close to the beach, so they did grab those rifles and start to utilize them. Now looking back now, obviously, you know the saying, hindsight is 2020. If, uh, for, if for, you had known now, if, if you knew then what you know now, what would, would there have been anything you had done differently or, or anything that you would have? Yeah, to stay at home. <laughs> <laughs> differently, not really, no. I mean, I was trained to do a job and, and uh, I, I always, uh, also, uh, when I was in England, uh, we were training, uh, I fired M1 for record and I uh, got the uh, top marksman for the M1 uh, rifle, which was unusual for a medic, by the way. Uh, yeah, then you wound up with a med, how did that happen? You went, your top marks of the rifle, then you wind up with a med pack and no rifle. <laughs> No, well, I, when I fired that rifle uh, for uh, over in England, uh, I, all I did was clean it and give it back to the sergeant up, and it loaned it to me to fire for record at that point. Uh, but uh, at a later time, uh, our, 
our battalion, the second battalion, was just outside of St. Lo, we were actually surrounded up on the Martindale Ridge. We were up there for two days surrounded, and I, I had no supplies at all. The, used to utilize those on the wounded. And so I just had to grab a rifle and fight along like an infantryman, which I knew how to do. I mean, I'd been with them for a long time training with them. And, uh, so, so I just grabbed one and I fired away too. What were, uh, you've said now that you're, you're you were scared that day and you're we, scared. understandably so. I mean, I would have been absolutely petrified. We were. <laughs> When you finally hit the relative safety of the, the berm, did you finally think, all right, now I can take a moment's rest, or was that not even on your mind? No, there wasn't. There was too much to be done. You, know, you didn't have time to rest, really. You know, there was guys wounded, and and one thing uh, uh, with the wounded, and I, and I certainly don't blame them. As soon as somebody's wounded, they holler medic, and and you have to make a decision whether you're going to go to them or wait until things quiet down a little bit. I mean, a lot of times, you know, fellows are wounded and you, you risk your life something awful to, to get to them. So you always have to be sort of alert a little bit along those lines as a combat medic. Uh, I kidded the fellows after the war, and by the way, the 29th Division has one of the largest uh, uh, groups that still meet up to right now, to, the, to this day. Uh, but I used to kid the fellows after the war. I said, you know, if I if I knew about Blue Cross, you guys would have paid through the nose. Each each week you'd have paid me, <laughs> just just to, to assure you that I'll come and get you in case you're wounded. And we kept we laughed about it. It was a big time joke for us, but so true. How, <clears throat> how did you respond? I mean, when you're on a beach and you see somebody get hit and go down, and they're screaming for you. And, how you have to you make you make a decision. Can I go right now? What's going on? I mean, if there's a machine gun shooting, you know, close by, you certainly have to give some thought. Hey, I can't get to him right this moment. And you'd holler to him. I'll be there, to, you know, I'll be there as soon as I can. And 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 also, fellows, when a, a man is wounded, his buddies help him too. His fellow imp, imp, dog faces, as we call them. They help them too as much as they can. Each soldier had on his cartridge belt or pistol belt, he had a medi little medical kit. And he would open that up and, and pull this metal thing, a little metal uh, case, and inside that case was bandage, the bandage. And with, I mean, many of my fellow riflemen, they were helping other guys, you know, and helping me in some cases, you know. Uh, put a patch fellows up. Now my job was to stay with the with the platoon. We had what is known as litter bearers that came from the battalion aid station, which is behind the front any place from 100 yards to a quarter mile back. And those fellows, those litter bearers would come up and pick up the, the ones that could were not called walking wounded. If a fellow was wounded and he could walk, we would tell him, walk, get back to the aid station, you go, on your own two feet. Uh, but if they were badly wounded and they had to be gotten back, uh, we would get the, uh, the, the stretcher bearers, four stretcher bearers would come up. And that was an extremely dangerous job, being a stretcher bear, because you don't have a foxhole to jump into. Uh, and they would come up and pick the the wounded person up and take them back to there, and that's where they would work on them back there. My job was just to patch them up quickly so we could get them off the front. That was it. Uh, if a fellow uh, had his leg blown off, we'll use that as the example. If you had your leg blown off, what we would do is I would get to them, and the first thing I would do is give them morphine. We had a little tubes, it looked like a toothpaste tube with a needle sticking out the top of it and a glass, little glass case sitting on top of that. You would pull that glass case, throw it out of the way, and you would jab the person 
with that morphine. That takes some of their pain away, most of their pain away. You do this very quickly. And then you would take that, that uh, morphine charrette and you would pin it so it can be seen, so that the next group of medics he, he comes to knows he's already had a shot of morphine. One of my friends one time lost his, his, his morphine sarret off his lapel and he got a second shot and he said he didn't know what was going on for three days after that. He said, he said it was one of the best parties he ever attended. <laughs> that was his answer to the thing. But then we had to get, you have to remember that the, the blood is spurting out from the, the artery here. You've got to block that artery off somewhat. So you would get, take the person, the guy's belt off if you could, stick that around his leg and tighten it. So you have a, uh, and at the same time, we also had iodine and we put a, a T like that, just on the head. And that indicated to everybody that handled that, that this guy was with, that he had already had a tourniquet put on. Because you have to release a tourniquet every so often. I think it's every 20 minutes or so. So we, with that T on their head, and, and also with the, you know, the morphine that we've also given them, it, it, it uh, calms them off an awful lot like that. We get them those stretcher bears to come up and pick them up and get them back to the rear, back to the, back to the uh, aid station. The aid station had a doctor, a medical doctor was assigned to the aid station, along with sergeants and guys. That, in fact, we even had, I think, a couple uh, uh, male nurses, RNs, back in the, the group I was with. Uh, it's just, it's <clears throat> unbelievable to think about, to try and comprehend the, the noise and the confusion of that day. Oh yeah, Other, the noise is unbelievable. Our machine guns are going off, their machine guns are going off, mortars are coming in. Mortars were something we were always scared of. I mean, and the Germans had a weapon called an 88 artillery piece. And that was quite a weapon. That was quite a weapon. It really was. Germans could put a mortar in your back pocket. That's what we used to kid about, talk about. Those Germans were good with the mortars. Very good. Now, when um, once you once you hit that seawall and then across to the road, did you ever look back to see other craft coming in, or was it you're just always you're looking in? The, I'm going my. You're I, going in that direction. That's right. That's right. I'm I'm going that direction, and you know, fellows are wounded up on that hill as we were going up. Uh, they would be wounded. Fortunately, I think we had three of them that were wounded on that, as I remember. You know in the mass confusion of what's going on there. I mean, he probably missed a lot of things too. But uh, fortunately, those guys on that hill that were wounded were not badly wounded, I remember that. Uh, one of the fellows I know got hit in the arm with a bullet. I remember that, and we threw a quick patch around his arm. Now, once you uh, made it through, through D-Day, then D plus one, two, three, all the way out, out for that. Uh, one, when did things finally start to calm down? Is it D plus one, D plus two? When did things finally uh, stop? I, it down? didn't calm down until we got, after Saint, when St. Lowe fell, that's the first that really calmed down for us. I mean, in the meantime, you're digging, the, the you know, in Normandy, as soon as you would you would be moving maybe a forward if you were fortunate, if your company was on the attack, uh, and you dug in right away. As soon as you stopped, you dug in. You didn't wait for anything because, as I said, those Germans were good with their uh, those German soldiers were good. They were good soldiers, and what we did not know, by the way. We were in what is known as the Bocage country in, pa in France, and that they had things called hedgerows, and those hedgerows in, ran in height any place from five foot up to maybe, I think I've seen them seven foot high. And what they were ways that they took their fields and blocked them off for the animals and for their farming purposes. And they were all over the place. 
And, but we were not told that we were, that we had these hedgerows. When we got there, that's when we realized we got these things, we didn't even know what they called, hedgerows. And the reason they couldn't, didn't tell us is because it would have been an indication of where we were going to go, that Normandy is the place that has the hedgerows. And we weren't told that, we did not know that. And I will, you know, I can understand why they didn't tell us, but I certainly wish we'd have known it. Now, you, they didn't tell, why was it that they didn't tell you about them? Because the only place in France that has those hedgerows is Normandy. And you know, the Germans had spies all over Britain at the time. We'll, no, we find out all this years later, but if they had found out, well, these guys are training for hedgerows, oh, the Germans would have figured that one out. They were no dummies by a long shot. They would have figured that out. Now, were those hedgerows a uh, detriment to you and your, your guys you were going through? Oh, you bet. You know, in the beginning, a tank could hardly get over them. I mean, a tank came up to it and went up in the air like that. And we're vulnerable because the bottom of a tank, the underside of a tank, is not that thick. And, and Jerry had his weapons too. He had his Panzer Fausts that could hit him. And, and some fella, uh, I think he was a staff sergeant, I read this later, he got this idea of putting like two forks on the front of the tanks that they were welded on there. In fact, I think that they used the materials that the Germans had placed on the beaches to try to deter our boats from getting in. And he got that steel and he actually uh, took those uh, and welded those on the front so when a tank hit one of those hedgerows, which were thick by the way, I and mean, they were quite thick too, they could work their way through. And that gave us tank support if we needed. The Germans were very good with the hedgerows and they knew, they, they knew exactly how to defend those hedgerows. The German, the German army's pl platoons were ba or units were based around their machine guns. Ours were based around our riflemen. Theirs were based around, they, they were very good with the machine guns. So they, they had emplacements around these hedgerows? They had already been digging in places and stuff like that through all this hedgerow country, yes. So they definitely had the tactical advantage? Oh, very definitely, yeah. We were attacking into them, yeah. Very definitely, yeah. We had the advantage with the artillery. Our American artillery, once it got organized and everything, our artillery was, was good, they were good. Now, did you guys have a, a radio man with your with your group? Oh yes, oh yeah, we had a radio man. The company had uh, a radio man with a big radio, and then each platoon had a hand radios. I think they were called SR600s. I'm not sure about that, but but the problem with those darn things, they chewed up batteries like mad. When you needed it, you went to oh, heck, we got to put a, more batteries in this thing. They burn up batteries like mad. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have communications, continual communications. You have in a company you have what is known as a runner too, the company runner. And he's picking messages back and forth and things like that, verbal messages. So is that a, which which position would you have not wanted if you were in your division, would you have, if you would, could have, if you had to pick which one, would you not want to be a, a runner? Would you rather be a radio man? Which would you, which one did you want? Which one did, did you not want? Well, I guess the, uh, the radio man, I wouldn't mind having been a radio man, probably. Uh, not too many people wanted to be a combat medic because it's a dangerous job. I mean, it's dangerous because they're scowling and screaming and you know that they need help now and you've got to make some decisions whether to move immediately. And then after you get to the person, you have to start making some more decisions. Here I am, a kid for crying out 20 years old, making decisions of, hey, give this guy two, another shot of morphine and stuff like that. You have to make decisions. 
You really do. If you saw that movie Private Ryan, by the way, when Private Ryan uh, was brought out, uh, when that movie first came out, the Philadelphia, Philadelphia Inquirer invited a number of men from the Philadelphia area who had been in the invasion and everything to come see that movie. And we went to, uh, as a group, we went to move that, see that movie uh, premiere in Philadelphia. And uh, then uh, they inter interviewed us afterwards or what we thought. And we said, well, well, the first, you know, 10 minutes of that movie is very, very factual. But when you see the way those, that platoon that went out to look for Private Ryan was wandering around, and we all laughed because you, we said that if you were in in Normandy at that time, you never stood up straight. You were always bent down because you just didn't want to get yourself shot if you could. That was just one of the things. But it was a it was a well done, good movie. But the first few minutes uh, of those scenes of uh, on the beach were very good. We thought thought they were good. Okay. So. Oh, wow. Where did you get, where did you receive medical training? I mean, how did you? Camp Grand, Illinois was a medical training facility that I went to. There was, there was another one. Of course, you have to understand that the, the training that we got then is nothing like the training they have today. The training today, I believe, is in Texas, Fort Sam Houston, I believe it is. Uh, they get wonderful training. For in the medical corps today, excellent training, uh, things that they can do and know how to do compared to what we knew, it's way beyond us. So. All right, now I only have a couple more questions for you. I promise it won't be much longer. That's okay. First question is, I know a lot of veterans from World War II do not like to talk about it. Oh. My grandfather's being two perfect examples of it. Right. Why is that? It's probably some of the, you know, we're all different people, you know. Uh, we have, are so different in so many ways. Uh, some fellas, as you say, you know, they did not want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it. And it's what they saw. I mean, some of the things that you saw was unbelievable. I can remember walking into a field that uh, had at least a hundred German bodies in it. Arms, legs, heads. They got, they got caught in that field and our artillery spotted them, I guess, and just blew the daylights out of that field. And they have all these bodies. And that can certainly affect certain people. Uh, I've been very fortunate. Uh, I have not had uh, 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 any problem, you know, discussing it like I am now. Uh, I've never had a problem with it. I think I had one night that I probably dreamed and my wife had to wake me up, but that, that's all in all the, the years. What do you credit for that? I mean, obviously having a wife by your side makes you... Uh, well, uh, I have no idea why, why. Uh, why have this affected? Uh, the 29th Division has a, a, a group called the 29th Division Association. It went into effect at the end of World War I, and it, it started at that time, and it's in effect right up to today. And I had the honor to be a national commander of that group in 1992-93 and at that time we had 4,000 members and uh, each year we had big reunions uh, we had as many as 600 people at our reunions at that time of course we're getting decimated today the veterans of world war one are fading away and uh, uh, but we're still we still have that organization now Obviously, you're sharing your story with us today, and I, I can't thank you enough for that. You're really what, what do you hope from people watching this tonight? Do you do you hope they remember this? Do they hope they remember? I the hope they remember the sacrifices that that men made in not only World War II, but for Korea and Vietnam, and our 
wars that were involved with today, to remember the veterans and, and what they have done and what they, they did in the past through the years. Uh, they, veterans are an honor to our country. They are definitely an honor to our, our people. And it's an honor to be a veteran, in my opinion. So, if, no. if somebody sees this tonight, and then tomorrow they're at the, the gas station or or walking down the street, and they, they see somebody wearing a 29th Division hat or an Army hat, Navy hat, what would you encourage them to do? What would you tell them to say to that person or do? I've had a number of people that have have come over and just said to me, thank you for what you did, and they don't know me from the man the moon, but they knew I was a veteran. Uh, I, I went down to, by the way, I went to the Washington Memorial to World War II, and I just got into the place, and I was walking along with my daughter, and this lady walked over to me, and she said, welcome. And I said to her, I said, I said, I'm a World War II veteran, but how did you know that? And she said, that's what I do. I stand here, and every time I see someone that looks about your age, I figure they're World War II people. And she says, I come over and just say thank you. And that's exactly what she did. That's all. It's they. Now, um, what would you say to other veterans? Is it important to share this, share their stories to save it? That's right. It, it, it would be good if you can talk, if they can talk about it to, to let, the, let their children and, and grandchildren know. You don't have to tell the gory part of war. Uh, I go and speak uh, from time to time uh, to various groups, and especially uh, 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 school groups, uh, high school groups, and I never talk about anything that's gory, ever. That's, I just talk about being a soldier, and, and that's it. And the history of what went on at that time, back in, the, in, the, in my time, but I certainly would encourage, uh, you know, uh, veterans to to discuss their experiences so that the people know. All right. And uh, along with that, I guess you'd encourage the younger generation to listen. To listen. Oh, very definitely. Very definitely. Uh, you know, it's like some kids like baseball and some kids like history. So. If you like it, if you have them that like history and just tell them the stories of what, but don't go into the gory part of war. War is, is rotten. It stinks, so to speak, but no. All right. But we, you know, you also, I met a lot of wonderful people and they're still my friends and I attend their funerals today, but I met a lot of wonderful people too. That, that served with me and in my unit. Yeah. All right. Well, Paul, I think that's got it. I can't think of anything else that we might have missed. Brett, can you think of anything? No, thank you guys go. Gentlemen, is there anything that we might have uh, might have forgotten about? Any questions that you guys might have? No? No. Paul? Hey. Thank you so very much. You're quite welcome. I cannot You're quite thank you welcome for sharing your story. You're quite welcome, man.